Hello, welcome to Edis English Literature. I am Ardhendu De. Today, I am going to read the part of soliloquy in Macbeth. We are going to discuss how this is an important dramatic convention in understanding Macbeth. The study of Macbeth is itself the study of different characters that pop up, particularly Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. And in those character studies, soliloquies are the main focus by which we can dive deep into those characters. And comprehending this part of soliloquy is itself a mental journey into the domain of that character. So understanding soliloquy is a must in understanding the characters of Macbeth as well as Lady Macbeth. So our primary focus is what is soliloquy and how the part of soliloquy is investing so much importance in understanding Macbeth. So first of all, what is soliloquy? Soliloquy is a solo speech in a dramatic language in order to communicate the inner structure and working of mind in a character. It is described as the outcome of natural situations on the characters of characters or on the state of characters emotions what characters do at some length what person never does speak alone for a considerable length of time and uh, in verse form in 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 soliloquy has the unique ability to suggest the subtleties of the hidden self of the speaker you know what i am speaking is the very words i deliver to the second person or the listener but when i am speaking to oneself i speak of my mind that's very simple uh, in 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 uh, elizabethan dramatic tradition particularly this type of soliloquies uh, become widely used as a vehicle for subjective utterances and become an important dramatic conference. You can take more of the university wits, master artist, Keat, master artist, Marlowe, those examples of soliloquies that we find in their great uh, uh, dramatic performances are simply superb. And Shakespeare's Hamlet, Othello, Macbeth, all are pregnant with this kind of soliloquies. So you cannot miss Dr. Foster's The Panish Tragedy as well as the part of the Othello and Macbeth as well as in Hamlet, the beautiful soliloquies. In fact, if you have to understand the part of the drama or the essence of the drama, you must dive deep into these characters, the title characters. And so part of understanding of the soliloquy is a must while understanding this sort of great tragic dramas. Again, uh, like that of a monologue, you know, a soliloquy and its imaginative space conveys a great deal of information about characters and their inner thoughts, feelings, passions, motives. Uh, in Macbeth, uh, you can find out too much of the psychological and philosophical interest of the play uh, reside in them. Okay, you if if you want to dive deep into the thought content of the Macbeth. You must have to study the soliloquy because there is the psychological panorama of Macbeth as well as Lady Macbeth and other characters who speaks of the soliloquy and the philosophy they entertain is also being exhibited by it. So the soliloquy in Macbeth is the part of psychological, philosophical and they are fascinating aspect of what Macbeth intends to do. That is Macbeth's motivation. Shakespeare in fact uses ample soliloquies in Macbeth to show the soul of the tragic hero, you know, who is trapped in the conflicting desires. And in very first soliloquy of Macbeth, we find him contemplating over the murder of King Duncan and its possible consequences. Just before the murder of King Duncan, Macbeth ponders over the very thought of it and says, it were done when it's done, then it were, well, it were done quickly. If the assassin could tremble up the consequence and catch with his 
success, success that but this blow might be the be all and the end all here but here upon this blank and soul of time you jump the life to come but in these cases we still have judgment here that we must teach blood instruction which being taught return to plague the inventor these even-handed justice commands the ingredients of a poison chalice to our own lips if there were any end of the matter as soon as the assassination was committed then it would be done immediately if it were not followed by net of evil consequences that brings success immediately if it would lead to no punishment in this life then he would risk judgment in the afterlife what seems clear is that Macbeth is constantly changing his mind he oscillates he vacillates his imagination is in the grip of the power of tensions between his desire to see himself as a king king and his his fear that what would happen immediately or just after the, the murder of the king what would happen what would be the consequences of it so Macbeth oscillates vacillates between the two extreme ends of the present situation he knows it would be disastrous in the next soliloquy just before the murder of Duncan um, Macbeth sees the fearful vision of a blood strained dagger leading him to Duncan's chamber he addresses the hallucination of the dragon he tries to grasp it but cannot and knows it is the product of his overheated brain addressing to the dragon it says art thou not fatal vision sensible to feeling as to right or art thou but a dragon of the mind a false creation proceeding from the heat of pressed brain the soliloquy is important here it traces the imaginative tension in Macbeth's character before the murder and to appreciate his divided nature that's why summing up his motivation with some quick judgment about his ambition is something one should resist and that resolves the issue too easily in fact Macbeth in a sense is tricked into murdering Duncan but he tricks himself uh, that makes the launching of his evil career something powerful and complexity about the nature of the evil in the play uh, we can have uh, the imagination of Duncan uh, you can have the imagination of Macbeth how Macbeth projects himself how Macbeth projects himself to commit the murder of King Duncan if one leg is dragged upon not to one leg is forward to commit that murder that oscillation that tension in Macbeth is the very nature of his persona and he ultimately commits that murder and he was battling his own battle the goodwill is being defeated and the evil of being the ambitious king or the wish to become an ambitious king or uh, becoming a king by murdering Duncan is being projected so when you are studying Macbeth just this part of the soliloquy is enough to understand that what happens in Macbeth's mind what tension props up in Macbeth's mind now however uh, Lady Macbeth thinks a little water will solve this immediate problem Macbeth knows that it is not too easy he cannot live with what he has done and demand the same person he says it in a beautiful soliloquy will all great neptune's ocean was this blood clean from my hands no this my hand will rather the multitude was says making the green one a red just after killing Duncan, Macbeth continues to murder his way in the frantic desire of peace of mind and root evils. The great bond that links him to other human beings does virtually disappear. So that the pursuit of his desire for inner peace 
makes him careless and less for anything life has to offer to him. Macbeth speeding, his dehumanization and utters the most poignant soliloquy that you can find out afterwards. So the maturity of the Macbeth or the part of the soliloquy and worth of it you can find out just act two and afterwards. I have lived long enough. My way of life is fallen into the city, the yellow leaf. And that which should accompany old age as honor, love, obedience, troop of friends, I must not look to have. But in their street, curses, not loud but deep, mouth honor, with which the poor heart would fain deny and dare not. Thus, at the news of his wife's death, he responds in a low key and bitter way in one of the overly greatest speeches in all of Shakespeare, he accepts the news of it with a horrifying calm. Out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frits his hour upon the stage and then is hard no more. It's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury signify nothing. This famous speech acknowledges fully the empty mockeries life has become. His life has become an instant farce, not because he no longer has any power or physical security, but because he has ceased to care about anything, even about his life. He is gradually dehumanized. So this type of theatrical metaphor quoted in the all of the soliloquies, particularly the last soliloquy I referred, resonates throughout the play. Macbeth has, in a sense, tried to seize control of the script of life, to write it in accordance with his desires, in a clear acknowledgement of that. Thus, all of the soliloquies of Macbeth become a close scrutiny of the study of evil and a conflicting soul of Macbeth's personality. So understanding the part of Macbeth or the psychic journey of Macbeth, you must go through soliloquies. Comprehending this kind of soliloquies is a must for understanding the true essence of this type of drama. this video lecture you have gone through the part of soliloquies or what they serve in the drama Macbeth. The part of soliloquies or comprehension of those soliloquies is a must for literary students. You must go through each soliloquies as a separate piece of poem and try to comprehend the inner core of the meaning and after deciphering the meanings of the archaic words simplified english is a must for better understanding of this soliloquy. so best wishes for your studies of soliloquies so like share comment and obviously subscribe to my channel if you find any difficulty in understanding this part you can just ask me pop-up questions i will try my best to give some possible answers bye bye